resources that we'll need on down the road. And so, Father, I pray that if somebody needs this tonight, you'd help them tonight. If not, I pray you'd bring it to our remembrance when we all stand in need of it in the days of head. Lord, I do pray for those that are sick. I pray for Brother Ray, you touch him. Lord, I'm thankful for the good report on Sister Mary. Thank you for touching her and help her. I pray for Brother Clint's mother. She's a sweet and dear Christian lady, and I pray for her. Lord, long before the doctors ever knew what it was, you knew what it was. And so, Father, I pray that, Lord, you'd intervene and your will would be done. I do pray for Brother Josh's niece. You'd touch little Maddie and help her in her sickness. I pray for Miss Caitlin's fiancé, Tyler. Lord, you'd touch him. They'd find out what's causing his problems. And then, Father, I do pray for those that are traveling, those that are providentially hindered, that you'd be with them. But I pray for the next few minutes tonight, Lord, you'd help us. May the Word of God become real. May it and illuminate, uh, may the Spirit of God illuminate the Word of God to our understanding. May we, Lord, uh, see it uh, for as you wrote it, and may we truly uh, grow thereby. May it become not only a light unto our, our feet and, and our paths, uh, but Lord, may it truly become an anchor for our soul. Now, Father, I pray that you'd use this unworthy vessel. And I pray for your people. I pray you'd encourage them tonight in the good things of God. We certainly pray to crowd this size if there's somebody unsaved, strangers to the gospel. And Lord, I pray that tonight would be the night that, Lord, they'd realize Jesus bled and died for them. Oh, Lord, realize their lost condition, realize their eternity without Christ. And I pray tonight would be the night they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved. Now, Father, have your will and way amongst us. And, Father, we'll bless you and praise you. For it's in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus we ask these things. Amen and amen. I'm interested in a couple things from this chapter tonight. But I want you to notice, first of all, an emphatic principle. Look in verse 33. The Bible says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. Now, I'll be honest with you tonight, I'm not going to preach a whole lot. I'm going to do more teaching tonight. This message is going to be a message of instruction. But notice this very emphatic principle that God is not the author of confusion. Can I say that Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians, to the church at Ephesus, Paul wrote... Uh, that there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. He, he makes it clear that God uh, put everything in order and God set forth one way. Uh, but yet today we find that there's uh, many different versions of the Bible. There's uh, many different denominations and religions. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of folks uh, that claim that they're Christians and claim that they're going to heaven, but uh, they've never heard a clear-cut presentation of the gospel. Uh, 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 they've just uh, 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 grown up in a church somewhere and think they're okay, or because that they, uh, uh, they've been sprinkled or been baptized as an infant, they're okay, uh, and they have no idea uh, 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 how dangerous it is to live in this world thinking they're okay, and really they've been made twofold the children of hell. They have no idea. Uh, and there's a lot of folks who are confused today. Well, I submit unto you that God's not the one that confused them. Can I say the devil's been hard at work at confusing people. He confused Eve in the garden. He twists the things of God and makes things sound so enticing, and folks buy it many times, hook, line, and sinker. If you're not careful, he'll come and tempt you to do things you normally wouldn't do. And, uh, but he makes it sound so good. He's, the, uh, he's a liar and the father of it. But can I say he's used a lot of things to confuse people. He's used religion to confuse people. He's used preachers to confuse people, so-called preachers. Can I say that he's used schools and science and uh, historians and all kinds of people to confuse people. 
It amazes me, people that have never picked up a Bible and wouldn't believe it if they did read it, uh, 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 will watch something on the Discovery Channel and some not hit on there, uh, uh, say something that uh, is not true about the Lord Jesus Christ, and they'll believe that hook, line, and sinker. Hmm? How are folks so confused? Because the devil's a master of it. But take note, God is not the author of confusion. That's a very emphatic principle. But then we find some educational parameters. Look at verse 34. The Bible says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted to, unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. We find some educational parameters right here. Notice the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth. Corinth was a very carnal church. Cor uh, Corinth knew just enough about uh, the Lord to make them dangerous. Uh, they had a lot of things going on in this church that was ungodly, that was wicked, uh, that was sinful. Uh, and Paul even lets them know uh, 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 at one point, he says, when I get there, I'm going to straighten everything out. But notice that Paul writes some things here uh, uh, to educate them, to instruct them. First of all, he said, let women be silent in the church. And you see that? Now, don't get upset at me. Paul was inspired to write it. Don't look at me like I got two heads. Uh, and he goes on to say, uh, 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 and if they'll learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, what is Paul talking about here? The Apostle Paul here is referring to where the Bible says that a woman should not usurp authority over the man. And I mentioned this in that message, and that's when y'all first got mad at me. But any time a man is present, a woman isn't to teach, a woman isn't to lead anything to service, a woman is not to have any way, shape, or form any part in the conducting of business in the church when the church is called to order a woman uh, is to be silent in the church now that is not to say that a woman can't sing in the church that isn't to say that a woman can't give her testimony now I've been in some independent Baptist churches where if Miss Crystal wanted to give a testimony she'd have to whisper it to you and you'd have to stand up and repeat what she said to you well, first of all, men don't listen that good. Uh, my wife will send me a story saying, now you know what you're supposed to get? Uh-huh. For me to only get to the store and don't remember a thing I'm supposed to get. I come back with a whole lot more than she asked for. What are you laughing at, Brother Charlie? You've done the same thing, haven't you? Huh? You don't listen any better than I do, do you? Here's the reality of it. My wife's testimony is the personal account of what Jesus has done for her. What God has done for her. How in the world can I give her testimony? I can't do it under the emphasis she can, nor could I do it the justice that she does. He's not talking about testimonies. He's not talking about singing. He's not talking about giving a prayer request. He's talking about a woman being in a position of authority. And when it talks about asking her husband at home, a woman's not to stand up and try and ask questions or try to do anything that usurps authority over the man of God or over the men in the church. If she doesn't understand anything, she's supposed to ask at home. What about a, a, a woman that don't have a husband or a woman that has a husband but he's not part of the church? What's she supposed to do? She's supposed to ask the deacons or, or, or make an appointment to, uh, uh, where she can meet with the pastor and his wife in their own time to ask those questions. So we see there's some educational parameters here. He goes on to say this in verse 38, and I'm rushing through this because I've got to get to the thought. We'll be here all night. Verse 38 says, But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. That word ignorant does not mean... It's not a derogatory term. It's not saying that that man has not the capability of learning. 
We have children in here, and I shouldn't use the word stupid. He's not saying let people be stupid, but I didn't use that word. I'm using the word ignorant, okay? What are you laughing at, Owen? Huh? Trust me, he's heard stupid before. Uh, he's not saying that. He's saying that if somebody chooses to be ignorant, if they choose to not receive instruction, if they choose... Uh, not to believe what the Lord says, well, then they're going to just have to be ignorant. Hmm? Now, listen, we're going to get into some things tonight, and, and unlike Brother Clint, it's going to be a little hairy. Okay? All right. The truth of the matter is, there are a lot of people that are lazy, and there are a lot of people who choose not to study or listen to somebody who has studied. They'd rather be ignorant than know the truth. Paul said, if they're going to be ignorant, let them be ignorant. Don't get bogged down trying to help somebody that doesn't want any help. I'm talking about saved people. I'm talking about people who claim to be saved. There are some people that you are never going to change them because they were raised to believe a certain way, and you can talk to them till you're blue in the face. You're not going to help them. Uh, uh, I, I remember... Uh, uh, my wife uh, has an uncle who started a, a mission work in Hazard, Kentucky. Anybody ever hear of the Dukes of Hazard? Anybody ever been to Hazard? Can I say this about Hazard, Kentucky? And I've got a good friend. You've all met him, Dean Damaris, pastors in Hazard. But Hazard is a very difficult place to build a work for God. And it's very difficult because it is a predominant Church of God area. And her uncle, he spent nine years down there, and he would win people to the Lord, and they'd come on Sunday, and then they'd tell him, well, I'm going to go hear Grandma preach next week. And he could talk to them till he was blue in the face that Grandma was not called of God to preach. But they didn't care, because Grandma had been a preacher all their life. And when she wasn't preaching, she was dipping snuff. Uh... Paul says there are some people you cannot help. Don't frustrate yourself and frustrate the grace of God trying to help people that don't want to learn. Because there's a lot of people who do want to learn. Hmm? we got a fellow sitting right here just a couple years ago was Roman Catholic. He was religious, but he wants to learn. He's a sponge. I didn't say he was SpongeBob. I said he's a sponge. He wants to learn everything he can. Hmm? There are others that uh, uh, want to learn, and they constantly are asking me questions or borrowing a book or something of that nature. And Paul is saying when people want it, give it to them. Uh, but when people choose to be ignorant and they don't want it, to go on down the road. You'll find somebody that will want it. So we see some educational parameters. But then we find the edifying precept. He says, let all things, verse 40, be done decently, and in order. That word edifying is very important. You'll find it in various forms in this chapter, I think six times. That word edifying simply means to build up somebody. It means uh, 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 to benefit somebody. It means uh, or to be a blessing to somebody. Notice it didn't say tear down somebody. It didn't say judge somebody. It didn't, uh, 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 say, be harmful to somebody. No, edification is something totally different. And can I say, when we come to the house of God, we ought to come to be edified. Uh, we ought to come, uh, ought to be enlightened to truth and be built up and have our faith built up on our, uh, 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 upon the Lord and upon the Scriptures. Uh, uh, we ought to come to be blessed. We ought to come to be encouraged. Uh, we ought to find some help. Uh, I'll never forget, Lord have mercy, this was... 25 years ago. This is why you never say never. Because there's a place I knew I'd never be invited to preach. And lo and behold, I was at a revival meeting here, and I believe it was Larry Seals preach. And the pastor of the church where I said I'd never be invited to preach come up and said, Preacher, will you come preach a meeting for us? Well, they had to pick me up off the floor. Never say never. So, I began to listen. He had a radio broadcast, and I thought, well, I want to listen to his preaching and see what he's feeding his people. Well, I listened to it for several weeks, and he didn't preach to his people. 
He skinned them. Every single service. Now listen, shepherds will tell you, you do have to shear the sheep. If you don't, uh, they're going to fall over on their side and they won't be able to get back up or they're going to uh, uh, get sticks and briars and things in their wool that's going to weigh them down uh, or uh, uh, it's just not going to be healthy for them. So yeah, you have to shear them, but you only shear them once, maybe twice a year. You don't skin the sheep every time they come to the house of God. If you do, you're going to get, you're going to get skinned and then you're going, they're going to bleed and and so I listened, and I thought, Lord, have mercy. And I got to pray, God, you got to help me. I'm going up there, and these poor people need some help. So it seemed like better every night. I just went and gave them grace. And the Lord really moved in the meeting. Say, what happened? He never had me back. Anyway, <laughs> I'm interested in verse 40, just a word out of this verse. He said, let all things be done decently and in order. This is what I want to preach, teach, whatever I'm doing tonight. This is what I want to, I want to, I want to use this thought. Order, but not ordered. Order, but not ordered. Now the Bible makes it clear that everything, when it comes to our, our worship of the Lord, when it comes to our assembling coming out from the world and assembling together, there needs to be order. If not, you've got chaos. So there has to be an order. But we've got to be very careful that we don't have everything ordered. I have yet to figure out, and I've only been preaching 36 years now, but I have yet to figure out these guys that can put their sermon topic on the marquee a week ahead of time. There have been times, and you know, there have been times I've been sitting right over there and somebody's singing and the Holy Spirit say, uh, turn over to such and such. And I turn over to such and such and he said, that's what you're preaching. That's hard living. When the Lord just tells you right before you got to take two steps and get up and deliver it. But what I'm saying is, if you've got everything so ordered that you don't let the Holy Spirit have any part in the service, you're in trouble. We're to be led of the Holy Spirit. We're not to grieve Him. We're not to quench Him. We're not to have everything so cut and dried that He can't work. Hmm? I know of churches that if you're going to sing a special, you've got to be on the list and, and have your schedule. Uh, I'm talking about months in advance. Well, I get to sing three months from now. Hope the rapture don't take place. Huh? Now, I understand when you got a lot of a lot of talent in the church, and we're blessed with a lot of talent. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 on Sunday mornings, I, I'm praying early before I get out of bed, praying, Lord, uh, speak to my heart. Who do you want to sing this morning? Uh, and and sometimes I let them know before they get here. Sometimes they won't. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, a lot of times. Uh, like tonight, uh, I'm trusting you to have a song on your heart. I don't want to ask you to sing uh, if you don't have a song on your heart. Uh, 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 we need to trust the Spirit of God to do some things in our service. Uh, we can't ever have everything so cut and dry. But there has to be an order. Hmm? And, and I know without a doubt, when we assemble, unless the Holy Ghost changes things, we're going to have a congregational song. We're going to have some special singing. Uh, and somewhere along the line, somebody's going to open this book and preach. But we have had services where he shows up. And we look up and it's 1 o'clock, 1.30 on Sunday morning. And I mean, the Holy Ghost has done the work. And it, it's time to just praise the Lord. Uh, order, but not order. Now, when expressing true order, the Apostle Paul reveals it reveals that it comes through several things in this chapter. Now, hang with me. I'm not trying to make you mad. But, uh, you know, if your grandma's a preacher and spits snuff, you might not appreciate this tonight, all right? Can I say, first of all, order comes through prophecy. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. 
For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, and exhortation, and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Now I said the first um, position or parameter of order comes through prophecy. Now before I comment any further, look up in chapter 13. These are very important verses, especially when you speak to somebody who's been raised in a church of God or assembly of God movement. Paul was inspired to write, Charity never faileth. An acronym for charity is love. You never go wrong loving people or showing people charity and kindness. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now what Paul is saying, he is saying that people were putting a lot of emphasis on certain spiritual gifts. You see, the, the apostles, the twelve apostles, the twelfth one was the apostle Paul, the apostles were granted apostolic gifts. They had special gifts that we only read about. Peter and Paul and James and John, under certain parameters, and as the Lord touched them and blessed them, they were able to lay hands on people and heal them. Can I say that the apostle Paul could heal other people, but yet when he got thorn in the flesh, he couldn't heal himself. I've heard people say, if you pray for healing and God don't heal you, it's because you didn't have the faith. Well, what do you do with Paul? He only wrote just about half the New Testament. I think he had some faith. Hmm? Can I say that Paul was saying that these apostolic gifts, he says, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Do you know what cease means? They stop. They will not continue. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Verse 9, for we know in part, we prophesy in part. Verse 10 is the, the pinnacle verse. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Every church of God that believes you can speak in tongues believes that verse number 10 is talking about Jesus because he's the only one perfect. That word perfect does not mean sinless. That word perfect means complete, entire, whole. What's he talking about? The Bible. They didn't have the Bible. Matter of fact, God was just inspiring some of those men to pin it down. Paul said, we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect, that which is completed... The word of God has come. Uh, then those things shall be done away with. That's what he's talking about. Now, what is prophecy? Prophecy was a gift that mm, those early apostles and some of the early preachers had uh, before the word of God was completed. So what was it? Well, the man of God would pray and seek God and meditate on the things of God uh, and God would cause him to stand and speak and deliver a message, and he would deliver a message that would edify the whole church. Matter of fact, there are a lot of people read where Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 souls were added to the church. And there's a lot of people who believe that that's what happens today. You just get there and all of a sudden God falls on you, you stand up and just uh, uh, deliver a message and people come to God. They'll tell you, if you use notes, you're not of God. Because Peter didn't use notes. Uh, Peter had the Holy Ghost doing it. And can I say, most of the preaching of people that use notes, if you looked at their notes, there's not a whole lot there. Most that comes through them comes through the Holy Ghost. Hmm? But can I say that that was prophecy, and he said prophecies would fail. 
And Paul says in verses 1 through 4, it's okay to desire spiritual gifts, and you ought to desire spiritual gifts. Say, so what is a spiritual gift? A spiritual gift is that the Holy Ghost will use you to impact somebody else's life. What did uh, Jesus say that the Comforter would do? He would uh, bring unto your remembrance all things, uh, and he told them right before he ascended into heaven, when the Holy Ghost came upon them, they'd be witnesses unto him uh, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. Uh, what is a spiritual gift? Uh, something the Holy Ghost will use in your life to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people have the spirit of prayer. They know how to pray. Some people have the spirit of the gift of gab. They know how to talk to people. Other people have the spirit uh, 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 of humility. Whatever spiritual gift God has blessed you with, you ought to be thankful for it. It's okay to desire spiritual gifts. I desire to be able to play that piano and sing like Daniel Waters. God never gave me that spiritual gift. Huh? Well, listen, isn't that like us? We always want to do what somebody else does. Why don't you just seek the Lord for what He can want you to do and just do what He lets you do? But Paul wrote in these verses that edification came through prophecies, prophesying. Well, today, what that refers to is through preaching. Well, how does the man of God get up and prophesy? We don't. We preach. How do you preach? We study the Bible. We study the Bible. We seek the Lord. The Lord puts a, a message or a passage on our heart. Uh, we study that out. He gives us the message. Uh, then at the appointed time, you stand up and deliver what God gave you. Hmm? What can I say? The preaching of the Word of God never returns void. Hmm? It'll accomplish what God wants it to do. Or if folks choose not to do what God's will is, it'll be a testimony against them at the judgment. But we see that prophesying is the important thing. Or in our day and age, preaching is the important thing. Thank God for singing. Singing just sets the table for preaching. Thank God for folks that pray. And prayer is where the power comes from. But God chose through the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. Thank God for preaching. Hmm? Thank God for a man of God that studies and will stand to deliver what thus saith the Lord that instructs us in the ways of righteousness, uh, that equips us to be the saint of God that God would have us to be. So we find that the first step of order comes through prophesying or through preaching. Hmm? You got a so-called church where all they ever have is dramas and all they ever have is concerts and all they ever have is something that appeals to the flesh and they don't have preaching of the Word of God, I'll show you folks that are shallow at best, but most likely lost. Mm. Mm. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So we find that he chooses preaching to establish order. But it goes a little farther than that. In order to have order not only takes preaching or prophesying, it also takes presentation. Notice in verse 5. He said, I would that you spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. Now, he mentioned tongues quite a bit in the first few verses. He talked about somebody who spake in an unknown tongue, and he speaketh not unto men, but unto God. And we're talking about edification and edifying people. And he talked about people that, uh, who speak in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. And in chapter 13, we saw where tongues would cease. Well, what in the world is tongues? It's not a bunch of jibber-jabbers, see my bow tie, see my bow tie, see my bow tie. It's not that. That's what they use, the, the phrase, see my bow tie. You go to a Church of God college, they'll give you that phrase, and you learn to say it real fast, and you're speaking in tongues. Well, when you got lips as big as mine and the wind's blowing real good, you can speak in tongues too. That's not tongues. The word tongues is a word we use for language. Now, what good would it do us tonight? All of us speak hillbilly. Very few of us actually speak English, but all of us speak hillbilly. Now, we speak English. 
And what good would it done if I would have had a preacher here from a foreign country who didn't speak English and he spake in his language and he got up and he spit and hollered and, spre- and preached and yelled and screamed and pounded the pulpit and did all kinds of things and we didn't understand a word he said. It would edify us zero. You say, boy, that guy got excited. Don't have any idea what he said. I'll tell you what, let's do a little experience. Naj, you're a graduate. Stand up. I'm going to put you on the spot. Now speak loud. I know that's against your nature. Just give us a couple lines of Creole. Will you do that? Just anything. I don't care. You can tell. It's just more than that. We know that one. It's going to say me. Just say some things in Creole. He's been gone from the island so long he don't even remember it. What a blessing. Mon de bonk. Took the air. Now see if he did a whole... You can sit down. I've seen enough of you, okay? If he did a whole message in that, we wouldn't understand any of it. I've been down there. They was trying to teach Dennis Celestine Creole back in November. Celestine's crazy. And... uh he was saying a bunch of stuff that even the folks that spoke in Creole didn't know what he was saying. It was, it was crazy. Was, what you do? We all laugh at Dennis because that's all you do with Brother Dennis, huh? I'll see him next week. But what, what, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying if you don't understand it, it doesn't edify. So who gets the edification? Whoever spoke it. So Paul's warning about that. Now I'm saying that because there, there are a lot of folks tell you that you can't be saved unless you speak in tongues. Huh? Well, show me chapter and verse for that. Huh? But Paul goes on to explain some things about presentation. He says, I would that ye all spake with tongues. Wouldn't it be a blessing if you knew about five or six languages and you could speak to anybody in any language? We've got a lot of folks moving this area that, that speak only Spanish. Wouldn't it be a blessing if... You didn't just learn Spanish in school to get an A, but you actually spoke it. And then we've got folks moving here from India. I don't know how many dialects they have, but wouldn't it be a blessing to be able to speak to folks in their language? Wouldn't it be a blessing to be able to speak to a lot of these uh, French Africans that are moving here to work at Amazon? Wouldn't it be a blessing to be able to... I wish somebody teach them how to drive, but wouldn't it be a blessing to be able to speak to them? It would certainly break down a lot of barriers. We could give them a clear-cut presentation of the gospel. Well, Paul said, I would that you all speak with tongues. Now, the apostle Paul was an educated man. He knew several different languages, and he could speak in several different languages. By the way, the miracle of Pentecost wasn't that Peter spake in tongues when the Spirit fell on him. The miracle was that every man there from whatever nationality all heard in their own language. That was the miracle. That while Peter spake in Hebrew, they all heard in their own natural language. Hmm? That was the miracle. But anyway, let's see what Paul says here. I've got to get through this. I would that y'all spake with tongues, but rather that, but rather that you prophesy. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Now, if we did have somebody here speaking in another language, and we've had that before. Uh, uh, the first time uh, 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 Brother uh, um, Roberto came. First time Brother Roberto came, he couldn't speak English, which blew me away because him and his family sang uh, at Calvary and some of the old songs in English. But he couldn't, he couldn't preach in English. Uh, he didn't know the language that well. Uh, 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 so he would uh, 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 preach for a minute and stop, and we had the fellow that brought him who interpreted, uh, and he would tell us what he said. Uh, then he'd preach, and then somebody would interpret and tell what he said. That is true New Testament tongues. Uh, when somebody speaks and you got an interpreter who tells us what he said so the church can be edified look what it says verse number six now brethren if I come unto you speaking with tongues what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine see I don't like that word doctrine 
When Jesus said that he came to bring a sword, that's what he was talking about. He didn't come to bring peace but a sword. What was he coming to bring? Doctrine. Doctrine divides. And in order to truly study the Bible, you've got to rightly divide the word of truth. And you find it, uh, the witness of doctrine written at least two, but usually two or three times uh, to the same people in the same context about the same stuff. And he goes on to say in verse 7, And even things uh, without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them was, is without signification. What Paul is saying, if the trumpet is blown and it don't sound like a trumpet, how can it warn those that are listening for a trumpet? What if all the instruments of music all sounded the same? There would be no distinction. But yet, when you get somebody playing a guitar and somebody playing a piano and somebody playing a bass guitar and people that are playing horns and people that are playing woodwinds and all, it can make beautiful harmonic music because they all have a very distinct sound. And can I say, when people of multi-languages on a Wednesday night across the world are worshiping God in their language uh, and people are being edified and God is being praised in heaven, it is a beautiful thing. It's very harmonic. Presentation. It all has to be done in order. It can't be done out of order and God be glorified and the church be edified. Hmm? So not only prophesying presentation, there's also perception. Verse 13 says, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret it. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than y'all. Yet in the church I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and with other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that, that will they not, they, for yet for all that will not, that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So we find that Paul is talking about perception, understanding. And if everything is done in confusion and there's no understanding of it, what does it profit? And by the way, he's right. Tongues were given as a sign. Tongues were not given so people could stand up and say, boy, I can speak in another language. It was a sign to the Jews from the prophecy of Joel chapter number 2, uh, and it was a sign to the Jews that the Messiah had come. That was the sign. See, Greeks have always sought wisdom. The Jews have always sought a sign. And the day of Pentecost was a sign to the Jews that the Messiah had come. Can I say God always has a reason for why he does what he does? He said, would it be better if God would just do great things like that today? He does do great things. But see, we're, we're looking at Hollywood and we're looking at all kinds of things. We want uh, the miracles of Acts, but we don't want the persecution of Acts. Can't have one without the other. 
You say, well, what miracles does God do today? He saves people. Huh? He takes people with brain tumors, and they don't have brain tumors no more. Hmm? Huh? He does all kinds of miracles. But we're too busy looking for things he don't do. Hmm? Instead of blessing him for what he does do. Oh, I got one more thing. A couple of you have already passed out. Huh? In order to have order... There has to be prophesying. It's got to be done in the right presentation. It's got to be done with perception. But can I say that also you've got to know your place. It's very simple. The blueprint for the local New Testament church is the church of the wilderness. God does not have a democracy. He has a theocracy. He's the head, and we're the body. Hmm? He's the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd. He has an under-shepherd that's to be submissive to him. And then the church needs to be submissive to the Lord through the under-shepherd and what he's preaching and teaching. Now, if the under-shepherd's wrong, the Lord take care of him. But as long as everybody is in their place, God blesses. When folks uh, start... Uh, pulling out their suspenders and trying to be what they're not supposed to be then you got problems hmm? it amazes me in how many churches the deacons think they're supposed to run the pastor they've never read Acts chapter 6 the deacons were first appointed because the pastors were to be given to the word and prayer and the deacons were mm, appointed in order to serve the, the pastor's table hmm it's not uh, the other way around. And it amazes me how many people think that because uh, the pastor gets a, a salary, then the pastor is a slave to them. It amazes me. It amazes me all kinds of things where people get things all out of order. We just need to know our place. Now let me help you something. The pastor is just a servant. He just has a calling of God to serve that local assembly. He's not to lord over God's sheep. He's not to rule God's sheep. He's to be a servant to God's sheep. Hmm? Uh, but the sheep are also to serve the Lord and not lord over the pastor. Hmm? <laughs> this is on my mind, i got to say it. Not in my notes, Donald. Go check them, all right? I know a fellow one time, church was considering him to become their pastor. He was driving a minivan with about 200,000 miles on it. Well, one of the deacons told this candidate for the pastorate that if he became pastorate, the deacons would tell him what kind of car he could drive and where he would live and dictate to him all kinds of things about his life. Well, the candidate made up his mind right then, this, this is not for me. So he looked at that deacon, the deacon's driving a Cadillac, about a year old. He looked at it and said, what are you driving? He said, well, I'm driving a Cadillac. He said, so you're better than the pastor. He got about that quiet. He said, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. He said, but it's okay for you to drive a Cadillac, but I'm not allowed to drive anything new. Huh? You see, we've got to know our place. You say, what are you talking about, preacher? Well, let's look at verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together in one place... And all speak with tongues. Everybody gets up and speak with a different language. And there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers. Let's just call them fad. Will they not say, you're mad? Well, he tells me I'm crazy all the time. That's why I used him, huh? But think about it. If everybody in here start speaking in a different language and we got somebody visiting first time they've ever been in church do you think they're going to say boy I want what they got 
They're going to say, that's a bunch of crazy right there. I'm trying to be kind, Brother Lucas, but it's not real in my nature. You know that. Huh? I have been at a singing where there are people who get up and jibber-jabber and say they're speaking in tongues and there are people rolling around on the floor and they've got to put sheets over these ladies because their dresses are up around their ears. And there are women doing chicken dances across the front. That's the best way I can describe it. They look like a chicken to me. And I want to tell you something. There is not a spirit of worship when that's going on. There's a spirit of fear. You're thinking, what in the world is going on here? And if somebody has never known church and come in on all that, they're going to think, I don't want any of this. Listen, I understand how raw I am. And when somebody comes here for the first time, I can be a little much. Ask Miss Crystal, you've got to come six weeks before you can get a hold of this, right? Isn't that what you said? Six weeks. Try it for six weeks, you'll get hooked. Hmm? There's a lot of people who make it about three and a half weeks. That's about all they can handle. You say, what are you trying to say, preacher? I'm saying that if we're not careful, we're different anyway. Do you realize when they see Baptists, they've already labeled us. That's the no fun crowd right there. Huh? Although I'm having the time of my life being saved. Huh? There's just certain things I choose not to do that the world offers because what I have in the Lord is a whole lot better than that. But they come in with reservation anyway. When they come in, they need to be made to feel warm and welcome. They ought to see folks who are friendly. They ought to see folks who enjoy being with one another. And they ought to see that when the preacher's preaching, everybody is really paying attention getting some help from this guy. Huh? That'll make a difference. Isn't it amazing how children learn real quickly there's something important about the altar? There's something important about when the preacher's hollering and screaming and everybody's paying attention to it. i got to tell you, this is funny. Uh, most of you know Jeff and Penny Davis. They have a son who has autism. has a certain kind of autism. <laughs> he was in church not long ago, and he was talking out loud. And his mom said, shh, shh, you got to be quiet. you got to be quiet. And he pointed at me and said, well, he's not being quiet. <laughs> he was right. But you got to know your place. Everybody can't get up and do can you imagine he's going to address all this I don't have time to expand on everything but can you imagine if we come to church and everybody sang a special y'all think I'm long winded I know a guy that was, was scheduled to preach a revival meeting and he got there and they sang 16 songs before he got up to preach can I say if we sang 16 songs everybody be wore out you know that, don't you? I mean, Thad's worn out after the congregational. I mean, you know, 16 songs? That guy's nerves was shot. And I happened to be there because I counted them. I thought, how many songs are they going to sing? I counted them. And I was sitting back in the back, right where Thad is. And uh, the preacher got up to preach. He said, Brother Doug Foster, pray for us. I'm thinking, oh, great. Put it on me to pray to pray get God down on this thing, huh? So I just prayed, and then he preached. But, I mean, I'm telling you what. Everybody can't sing every service. Everybody can't testify every service. I mean, I understand everybody that here is saved. You have a reason to praise God for something, but you can't do it every service. Uh, 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 not every preacher that we have here tonight uh, could get up and preach all of us. I mean, sometimes we do tag team with seven minutes, but, but can you imagine if we all preach 45 minutes? Thad, you'd really have gray hair if we all preached tonight. Aren't you glad you came tonight, huh? Huh? What a blessing. Can you imagine? And if somebody came the first time and everybody sang and everybody gave a, a testimony and every preacher preached, can you imagine? I, I tell you what, they wouldn't come back. I tell you what, I wouldn't come back either. Saved, I wouldn't come back. I got to say this. I don't know what I'm on all this stuff. When Taya first started coming with Christian, you know, they come up from college and, and come. And you know how sometimes I just pick people out to sing. She was scared to death for the first six months she came here. I was just going to call on her to come up and sing. He said, he don't call on people that don't sing. 
She was scared to death. I was just going to call on her, huh? You got to know your place. Look at verse 14. But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, and he is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. So, and so falling down on his face, he'll worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Uh, how is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, uh, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. Uh, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be uh, 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 by two or at the most by three, uh, and that by course let one interpret. Uh, and if there be no interpreter, uh, let him keep silence in the church uh, and let him speak to himself and to God. Hmm? Pretty, pretty plain, isn't it? Uh, Got to know your place. I'll say this. I told somebody this the other day. I know pastors, they were having a singing church house was full and folks were singing and all of a sudden some of that church God crowd was in the back and they started up, stood up and started speaking in tongues and pastor stopped everything he said whoa 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 you're welcome to stay you're welcome here but we don't do that here well the singers got to sing again they stood up and did it again the pastor stopped everything said okay everybody by your heads I'm going to interpret what they said the pastor said they just uh, said in tongues that they're going to donate $5,000 to the building fund Said four people raised their head, then we folks got out and got out, huh? It's true. True story. Huh? Yeah. Again, there are folks who are unlearned. And by the way, that Church of God movement was born in the mountains, and I'm not being ugly, but was born in the mountains where a lot of people didn't even know how to read. And that Church of God movement was building in that stuff. And if you notice, most of those churches, the women are the head of the church. Most of the men just show up because their wives tell them to because the wife's going to beat them up if they don't come. And they sit in the back. They never say anything, never do anything. Uh, 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 and listen, they choose... Uh, not to listen to truth. They choose not to sit down with somebody and let somebody expound to them. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Uh, this is what tongues mean. This is what the Bible says. Uh, do you have an interpreter? And they'll say, well, Paul said an unknown tongue, so I'm speaking in an unknown tongue that nobody knows, uh, and I'm speaking it back to God. Most of the people that are there speaking in tongues are trying to show somebody up uh, and to show somebody and say, I'm more spiritual than you. Look at what I'm doing. Doing. Paul said, no, everything that's to be done is to be done unto edifying, and it's to glorify God. Amen. If the church isn't edified, God's not glorified. Amen. Jesus loved the church and Amen. gave himself for it. So everything's to be done in order, not ordered. We've got a wonderful church. We've got a wonderful Baptist history we got a wonderful Lord who's given us wonderful truth, and thanks be unto God that we have truth. You know it's only by the grace of God you've been taught truth. It's only by the grace of God you're not somewhere being taught something that does not glorify God, and you think you're glorifying God. Now let me say this. I've said a whole lot about people speaking in tongues and people's grandma's a preacher and all that. Listen, there's a lot of good-hearted people that think they're doing right. They've never been taught. And to be truthful with you, the Bible says where much is given, much is required. God expects more from us that have the truth than those that have never been taught the truth. Now, some have been exposed to truth, Brother Clint, and they choose to ignore it. Paul said, if they're going to be ignorant, let them be ignorant. But there are some people that really don't know. They really in their heart think they're worshiping God and they think they're doing right don't throw off on them people pray for them pray that maybe somehow somebody well, hey, God will send somebody to them and they'll have an open heart and they'll be listen to truth you know that Apollos believed in the wrong kind of baptism and Paul explained to him a more and Aquila and Priscilla and then Paul explained to him a more excellent way there are some people that believe in the Lord, but they don't have all their doctrines straight. Uh, 
pray the Lord will send somebody or maybe use you to show them a more excellent way. That's what we're to do. We're to show them order. We're to show them how God evolved. When people take their doctrine out of the book of Acts, they don't realize Acts is a progressive book that has taken us from Judaism to what we have today, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and the, and the age of grace. They don't understand. They think grace started in Acts chapter 2. Many of them think the church started in Acts chapter 2. How do you add 3,000 to something that didn't exist? There was already 120 in the upper room. Who were they? Huh? So a lot of people just haven't been taught properly. That don't mean they're evil. It just means they need to learn a more excellent way. And by the way, there's none of us with a halo on. I, I, I've been saved 49 years. I'm still learning. God's still showing me things. And God's still showing you things if you're honest. And so we're not to act like we've arrived. But we are to edify when we come to the house of God. And we're to worship the Lord when we come here. And we're to edify and bless people and build people up and encourage people when we're here. And when folks come in and maybe don't believe the way we believe, that's okay. Huh? We'll take some time and teach them if they're teachable. That's no problem. I'd rather have folks that are coming because they love Jesus and they want to learn than have folks that come because they think they know it all. Hmm? I've been around that crowd too. Hmm? Thanks be unto God for truth. And thanks be unto God for order. And thanks be unto God that we're not so rigid. We've ordered every facet of the service I bless the Lord maybe the Lord spoke to your heart tonight and you just want to come and thank him we ought to all thank him we have the truth you know most of the world's never even heard the name Jesus Christ hmm? you've got the truth you've got a church in your neighborhood you've got a place where you can come and worship you ought to be thankful for that maybe tonight the Lord's laid somebody on your heart you want to pray for we ought to come pray for him Maybe you're here tonight and the Lord's been dealing with you about getting saved. Well, you ought to come tonight and let us take a Bible and show you how to be saved. You can be saved tonight. And maybe he spoke to you about something else. So let's all stand, Brother Clint. Come get a song of invitation. While Brother Clint gets a song, God spoke to your heart. You come. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the Bible. Lord, there was so much in that chapter we could have brought out and so much probably we should have brought out. Lord, thank you for truth. Thank you for a more excellent way. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us and showing us things and revealing things to us in the Bible. You said, seek and you shall find. Lord, I pray for those that are caught up in non-truths, that think they're doing okay, think they're doing right. Lord, I pray for them. I pray they'd see the more excellent way. They'd come to understand truth. And Father, those that are in denominations that, Lord, aren't saved but think they're okay, help us be a light to them. Help us, Lord, to win them before it's everlasting too late. Bless now in this invitation. Speak to hearts. Lord, speak to one that may be lost. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn away. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.